thank the Kidney Cancer Association Planning Committee for the opportunity to present today. Um, so I wanted to address a couple of questions related to toxicity in the context of metastatic renal cell carcinoma, and I have a little bit of a game plan in terms of this 10-minute time limit here. So I'm going to very briefly go over what comparative data exists to date, and what I'll suggest is that we really don't have enough comparative data as it stands right now to really address therapeutic selection. So then I'll move on to the next portion of this talk to discuss who will develop toxicity, whether or not these toxicities can be prevented, and finally, whether or not there are certain settings in which toxicity considerations might be more relevant. And then we'll wrap up by talking about whether or not certain toxicities are associated with response and whether or not dose adjustment, which Dr. Vaishan Pine highlighted to some extent, um, is actually relevant and can potentially optimize therapy. Um, so the first question at hand here is what comparative data exists? And I'll suggest that in the context of a clinically relevant decisions uh, at hand, we really have one trial that addresses this, and this is the COMPARS trial. We're all familiar with this design and treatment-naive patients. Patients were randomized to receive either sunitinib or pizopinib therapy. There were several toxicities, for instance, hepatotoxicity that favored sunitinib. We saw several toxicities, fatigue, hand-foot syndrome, et cetera, that favored pizopinib therapy. So I actually find this data so somewhat useful in terms of counseling patients from day to day in the clinic. Now, what we need, I would propose, and these are the NCCN guidelines, are uh, trials that really address relevant comparisons that we also face from day to day in the clinic. For instance, in the first line setting, we really don't have toxicity data putting pizopinib and bevacizumab side by side, for instance, in, in phase three trials. And perhaps even more pressing, we actually don't have comparisons in the second line setting, for instance, between axitinib and neverolimus. And this is certainly a decision that we still struggle with. We do have, for instance, the 404 study comparing serafinib and temsorolimus but I'd argue that those are distinct agents. So that's what we need, and what we will need down the line is actually the data emerging from ongoing clinical trials that were highlighted earlier today. Uh, Dr. Gore presented the uh, randomized trial comparing everolimus and nivolumab. Uh, Dr. Chueri presented the Meteor trial comparing everolimus and cabozantinib. I think just as important as comparing efficacy across these trials, if we can potentially do that, we'll really need to take a long, hard look at toxicity. So again, I've suggested here that we don't really have enough comparative data to guide therapeutic selection right now in the clinic. So in light of that, what can we turn to next? Well, how about prediction of toxicity? Who will develop these toxicities in the clinic? And uh, for that, I would suggest the preponderance of research to date has focused on single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. I've highlighted this very nice paper from uh, Jenny Kim and colleagues uh, from when she was at the Cleveland Clinic, in which they looked at 63 patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma treated with sunitinib. They identified one VEGF SNP at position minus 634 that was associated with the prevalence and duration of sunitinib-induced hypertension. I'll suggest that this particular SNP was not associated with clinical outcome, although they did find a pairing of a VEGF SNP and a VEGF R2 SNP that was associated with overall survival. I'm giving you a bird's eye view here of several relevant studies that were done associating SNPs with certain toxicities. I've summarized several trials here looking at toxicities associated with SNPnib and various SNPs in both clear cell metastatic kidney cancer patients and GIST patients. We see several distinct SNPs, I'll point out, associated with hypertension, others associated with hypothyroidism. In the context of bevacizumab therapy, relatively large cohorts assessed with breast cancer and renal cell carcinoma, where again we see distinct SNPs associated with hypertension in the context of serafinib therapy uh, and amongst metastatic renal cell carcinoma patients, we see that UGT1A9 polymorphisms can predict the uh, onset and frequency of grade greater than or equal to 2 diarrhea. So a heterogeneous array of agents have been assessed across a heterogeneous array of diseases for a heterogeneous array of outcomes. So right now, I don't think that SNPs are really ready for prime time uh, for prediction of toxicity in the clinic. So if we can't predict toxicity, how about preventing toxicity? Um, and very oftentimes when I get referrals from my uh, community-based oncologists uh, surrounding me, uh, the questions center around management of sunitinib-related toxicities or serafinib-related toxicities, and there are just outstanding peer-reviewed articles in the literature right now that propose how we might actually address some of these toxicities from day to day, um, uh, many written by some uh, authors sitting here in the room right now. But in terms of toxicity prevention, I really don't have a lot of great resources. So I wanted to just throw out a proposal that we're working on at City of Hope that might potentially address this issue, and perhaps other studies may come in the same fashion down the line.
So Dr. Porta and colleagues have put together a really outstanding piece. Uh, this was an expert consensus panel that convened to address toxicities related to everolimus therapy. Uh, I'm throw, uh, throwing up here a, a table uh, from their outstanding piece related to management of mucositis. For grade one mucositis, for instance, they've proposed using non-alcoholic mouthwashes or saline solutions. For grade two through four disease, they've proposed using topical analgesics, corticosteroids, and antimicrobial agents. So one thing that we're actually working on at City of Hope is actually using some of these regimens in a prophylactic fashion. I'm working with my breast cancer colleagues on a concept in which we'll randomize patients in a two-by-two -two design to either no prophylaxis, to budesonide, an oral uh, corticosteroid, minocycline, an oral tetracycline, or the combination of these agents. And our primary endpoint in the study is the incidence of stomatitis at two months. This actually comes from that same piece from Dr. Porta and identifies that the bulk of these toxicities actually occur within a two to three month span. Okay, so if we can't prevent toxicities, how about identifying settings in which toxicities are most relevant? Uh, Dr. McKay actually presented an outstanding case earlier of an older adult with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. I think many of us would agree that that's a setting in which uh, toxicities related to therapy are particularly relevant. Also those with extensive comorbidities. We've had some presenters here today uh, outlining cardiac toxicities. I'd also argue that toxicities are also very relevant at the extremes of therapy. Our patients with localized disease who are contemplating agile in therapy and those individuals who are heavily pretreated. So I just wanted to throw out a couple of examples of data in this regard. I presented this at the KCA meeting last year and it's since been published. Uh, this is an institutional series of 220 patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Uh, what we observed is that patients above the age of 75 actually did uh, far worse than those patients below the age of 75 in terms of overall survival. And I wanted to highlight one particular element of uh, this report and that patients age greater than or equal to 75 discontinued continued therapy less frequently due to progression and actually more frequently due to toxicity. That's highlighted in this table here below. Um, I, I had some communication with Dr. Haas, and I think this is a great uh, reminder of the relevance of toxicity in the adjuvant setting. Uh, this is the ASSURE trial in which patients were initially randomized to sinitinib at full doses, serafinib at full doses, or placebo. And as many of us are aware who participated in this study, these doses actually had to be modified due to poor tolerance in the adjuvant setting. Uh, patients ultimately received sinitinib at 37 and a half milligrams, serafinib at actually half the standard dose, and they were escalated if they didn't incur toxicity after two cycles of treatment. I think this is going to be especially important as we uh, uh, really sort of take on this barrage of adjuvant clinical trials that are ongoing. So far, we don't have efficacy data from any of these studies out from outside of a riser, which was presented at ASCO this year. But as these studies emerge, I certainly think it's going to be important for us to weigh in efficacy data, but also consider toxicities associated with these therapies, given the lower threshold in the adjuvant setting. Uh, in the last couple of moments here, I wanted to turn my attention to whether or not there are certain toxicities that are associated with clinical outcome. We've seen a lot of really outstanding data over the past couple of years uh, relating systolic and diastolic hypertension to clinical outcome in patients receiving VEGF TKI therapy. Um, what I've highlighted here are two studies looking at sinitinib and tizvozinib. These are two amongst many uh, that have associated systolic hypertension with benefit and progression-free survival and overall survival. Uh, we see that uh, with sinitinib and axitinib, two Two studies here uh, identify a similar benefit in progression-free survival and overall survival amongst individuals who incurred diastolic hypertension. But rather than focusing on hypertension, I wanted to just call to some other side effects that we don't focus on too often in the context of uh, these sessions. First, hypothyroidism. Uh, Dr. Donskov, who is in the audience today, has participated in a study associating uh, uh, hypothyroidism uh, associated with sinitinib-treated patients with clinical outcome. Progression-free survival seemed to be higher in this population of patients. In a series of 770 patients receiving sinitinib therapy, fatigue was actually associated with improved progression-free and overall survival. Certainly, this may simply be related to longer drug exposure. In the same series of patients, hand-foot syndrome was related to clinical outcome. Uh, overall, response rate improved in, in the population of patients developing hand-foot syndrome, as did overall survival. Turning our attention to mTOR inhibitors, what we see is that uh, in a small series of patients, uh, the subset of patients who developed pneumonitis actually had a lower rate of progressive disease as best response. And, and what I thought was a very well-done study based on the pivotal temsorolimus data Cholesterol increases seem to be associated with longer survival and progression-free survival. So a couple of toxicities that we don't traditionally focus on uh, that may potentially be associated with clinical outcome.
So if certain toxicities are associated with response, can we actually dose adjust uh, to optimize therapy? And Dr. Vaishan Payan actually hit on this earlier, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this topic. Uh, Dr. Rini and colleagues have taught us a lot through the AXIS trial. Uh, these are the criteria for dose titration within AXIS, and ultimately we saw that 17% of patients were titrated to 7 milligrams BID, 23% of patients to 10 milligrams BID. Um, and ultimately what we saw is that patients who were at higher doses of axitinib and lower doses of axitinib had a relative similar progression-free survival. Uh, certainly this may be a phenomenon associated with uh, the AUC of these agents and patients that were titrated upwards. I think the Dr. Vaishampayan hit on some of that data. Uh, this is one example amongst many of studies that are ongoing uh, to assess the effectiveness of dose titration. I wanted to highlight a study uh, done by my colleague, Dr. Bjarnson, uh, at Sunnybrook. Uh, this is a really innovative trial being run at 11 centers currently with 56 patients enrolled. Uh, he's randomizing patients uh, to receive varying schedules of sunitinib therapy. And in patients who don't incur toxicity, they may actually be titrated upwards to 75 milligrams on a 14-day on, 7-day off schedule. So we've taken aim at a couple of questions related to toxicity and metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Uh, because of this uh, very stringent time limit, we really haven't gone over toxicities with some novel agents, PD-1 inhibitors and vaccine therapies. We really haven't delved into the biology of toxicity as much as I'd like, and we haven't talked about some patient preference designs, such as in Pisces or, or Gemini. Um, but nonetheless, I hope we've provided some framework in which to assess toxicity in the context of therapeutic decision making. Thank you.